Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Lolita Cross and I'm an independent curator. It's an honor tonight to introduce the great Peter Song. <laughs> Often considered one of the fathers of pop art and a successor to surrealism, Peter Saul is known for his distinctively colorful and cartoon-like paintings which satirize American culture. His humor and aesthetic has influenced past and current generations of artists. From his first solo exhibition in Chicago in 1961 to his current survey at the Schoen Kunsthalle in Frankfurt, Peter Saul remains one of the most relevant artists of his era. All right, I'm going to pass you the. Is this working better now? Is this louder? Okay, perfect. And I'm going to go ahead with the first question. So, hi, Peter. Hello. <laughs> Can everybody hear Peter? All good? Okay. Um, so first, how did you get into painting? Can you please tell us, this is one of your first works. Well, I got into painting, my mother gave me a small... a little closer? My mother gave me a small box of oil paints for a Christmas present in 1947. That's how I started. <laughs> So you started in America, but then you lived in Europe when you first started painting. Can you talk about the time in Paris, from your paperboy days to the first time you met Roberto Mata, who I believe was the one who got you into... Well, I got to Paris after art school. Uh, I had a girlfriend and we agreed on what we wanted to do. We wanted to go to Europe and live in a beautiful city and never return to the United States. It seemed to us ugly, uh, stupid, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it was not a place to be, so we wanted to be gone, and so we ended up in Europe looking for a place that we could live in a beautiful manner. And it turned out to be very difficult, as you would imagine. We didn't get what we were looking for. <laughs> what, uh, what I was looking for was a beautiful studio, like a Matisse had, you know, where you open the French doors and you look out on the Mediterranean. I never found that. But we did find a kind of a lifestyle there where I could walk around. I could walk around and um, enjoy myself and not be bothered by people. I didn't speak any foreign languages. I just walked around and sat down in cafes. I smoked cigarettes and I drank beer and I had a studio space where I could paint. That was my life. Uh, this was arranged pretty much by an art dealer who became my very best friend, Alan Frumkin. And I met him through Mata, the artist, who I only met twice. It, it, uh, this is also accidental and complicated that I can't even possibly recount it in the time that we got here. Suddenly I had at my disposal a monthly income of $1,000, which was considerable in those days, back in 1962. I had $1,000 a month, and I could paint any picture I wanted to paint, and life seemed adorable. And then you lived in Italy. I, we in moved Italy. to Italy as soon as we could afford it. We moved to Rome, Italy to get the sunshine. Right, and you lived in, can you talk about when you lived in the back of your church? And I'm saying that because oh, yes. Oh, yes. crucifixes fixes come up a lot in your work. As I lost my see. studio space. In Rome, we were living on the outskirts. And I lost my studio space because Madame New, a famous politician of uh, South, uh, what was it? Well, Madame, you know the, the, the war down there. <laughs> Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I had to leave my studio and the, the, the landlord was the priest at the local church and he, and he felt kind of sorry for me and he said, well, you can paint in the church, you just can't paint on Sunday mornings. This well. is the Catholic church. <laughs> so I said, okay. And so the fact that I was painting in that little concrete room behind the altar gave me the idea of painting the crucifixion. I mean, why not, you know? <laughs> Rome, Italy is full of pictures of crucifixions. <laughs> so I said, I'll try my hand at it. That's 
so you got a crucifix. Yeah, yeah. I thought I would put Donald Duck on the cross because it's more unusual. Yeah, Donald Duck comes up a lot in New work. Why? Yes. Why him? There's no really good reason. What happened was, I felt that it was a way to be more original, more more unusual. I, I wanted my picture to be looked at. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about my pictures. Uh, Can you what, put your, your mic a little closer? Okay. What motivates these things? Well, the picture needs to be looked at. It's absolutely essential. Maybe try this mic, sorry. Uh-oh. Having... I'm not doing it right. Hello, is this better? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, it's absolutely essential that my painting be looked at, in my opinion. I'm completely at the mercy of a businessman who's decided to send me $1,000 a month. And uh, fate, I have no idea why he's doing this, why he's sending me this money. <laughs> I don't travel. I, I don't go to the United States to see my shows. I'm not very interested. I'm a strong Communist Party type. Uh, I dislike the idea of wealth, obviously, and all that kind of thing. At the same time, I'm trying to become as wealthy as I can. And this is a complicated situation. Entirely normal, I have a feeling. Anyway, uh, there but I was. You, so you, your work is so much about American politics and culture and history. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was making use of it. I wasn't yeah. really criticizing it. This is an odd thing. The, the, it didn't occur to me to be a very, very thoughtful person and <laughs> ask myself, why am I doing this? Right. It occurred to me that I had received a lucky break that for some unknown reason, I was extremely isolated. I didn't know any other artists. We didn't meet any artists in Europe, hardly. I only saw Nata twice. Right. And, anyway, this is very, most of my time, if not my whole life, in these days was spent uh, by myself and my girlfriend. And she was even more isolated than I was. A very, very negative person. I was already very <laughs> negative. I was very negative, and this woman was more negative than me. So we have a high degree of negativity between the two of us. And so we didn't get to know anyone. <laughs> and so because you were so angry, you were... I wasn't angry. I just simply negative? enjoyed not knowing people. I walked around beautiful cities, and I smoked cigarettes, and I drank glasses of beer. And I just enjoyed that all by itself. It seemed a great privilege. Um, there's many, you touched on many sensitive subjects. So I pulled up this slice of uh, Angela Davis on a cross. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why, it, well, so you talk about politics, talk about religion, talk about war. Is there anything you don't want to depict? Anything you just don't want to touch? Well, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, you mean verbally. No, 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 on a painting. Oh. Probably, yes. I promised not to do 9-11. I promised my wife not to do 9-11. And I, I'm trying very, very hard to skip sex and violence unless it's humorous. Okay. And even if it's humorous, I try to skip it. But sometimes I forget, and there it is. <laughs> jokes about people getting killed, jokes about women, you know, there it is, there it is. Right. So I admit to these crimes in, in art. But they all, all of your painting live in some kind of alternative reality, and um, in, in which historical and art historical events are caricatures. Is humor for you a way to de-dramatize the situation? Yeah. And I, make it okay? I, I, I guess I don't really know. You know, I haven't done the, the thinking <laughs> that you might have think I would have done because I was never a graduate student. Right. I never was presented by the teacher with questions concerning uh, my motivations or what the work should mean or should not mean. Right. These things just never occurred to me. I left my art schooling after four years, had a BFA, uh, we went to Europe. I didn't get to meet anyone there very much, and the few people I did meet were totally crazy. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Europeans. Crazy. Yeah, but they, they just, life seemed 
ridiculous except that I was somehow working towards a situation where I could live freely off my art. And I didn't think about what the art meant. I wasn't concerned with the values of art, like, you know, should art do this, should art do that? I have no idea what art should do, then or now. I was thinking of myself. I was thinking of how can I get this crazy field of modern art, which I feel I'm well adapted to, how can I get this to work for me? But I think you also want to get some kind of reaction. Can you talk about the first well, time? Well, I, I don't know what I wanted. I, well... Here's, here, here's the fact. <laughs> the fact is, I never got to the question of asking myself, how do you feel about this? Instead of which, my thought was, is this picture worth looking at? Right. Is any human being going to look at this picture with real interest? And at that point, I forced my picture to be interested, and I divorced myself from the picture and said to my picture, you can do anything you want. You can be fascist. You can be cruel. Yeah. You can do any damn thing. Just do it. And the picture always responded. The picture always said, okay, I'll do it, you know. And, and that was it. That's what I did. Do you, do you think art appreciation should, however, be about the reaction it provokes? Or? I don't know, I don't know. Don't I, know I keep hoping that art appreciation will come my way. <laughs> <laughs> and it has since 2000, somewhat come my way. And I'm very, very grateful to it and hope it continues. I don't try to predict it. So far, I've been unable to even guess what art appreciation might appreciate. Mm. It's just incredible. There is a memory um, that I read about when you first attended the Picasso exhibition in 1939. Oh, yes. Which, I didn't actually sorry. attend it. What happened was it was headlines in the San Francisco Chronicle. Some older people who felt they didn't have enough money to live on staged a riot at the local art museum in San Francisco because theoretically they had heard or something that this Spanish guy, Pablo Picasso, was selling childish looking pictures for $8,000 each. <laughs> so they, they, they had stormed the museum. These are people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And my parents took note of this in the newspaper and I think they laughed about it. And so I looked at it too. This was 3940. That's pretty great. So it probably influenced you somehow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I saw art as misbehavior. Right. And I wanted to do it very, very much. So what's your relationship with political correctness as a whole? Uh-oh. I, I fear it greatly. I fear it enormously. Political correctness means someone's trying to stop you from doing something in your art. It means you would have painted a picture, but you didn't because of political correctness. I try never to think about it, frankly. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those gloomy things like cancer, or you know what I mean. It can happen to you. You can have a heart attack, or you can have political correctness. <laughs> That's, I agree with that. Can you understand that some people might feel offended by some of your pieces? No, no, I, I don't understand people who react to objects with real strong feelings. I mean, an object is hardly <laughs> worthy of that. If Hitler had done nothing but paint pictures, everything would have been a lot better. <laughs> Show you that. <laughs> um, do you ever get offended? I don't think so. I think I, I don't bother with things if I already agree with them. I prefer reading things I don't agree with. It makes me laugh, quite likely. I don't know. And as far as looking at things, uh, I, I don't have any particular... If I don't know the artist and the picture is not hand-painted of something, I don't pay much attention. Interesting. So the technique is important to you and you have a very unique technique. Is that a way to catch the viewer? In, in a sense, you're Yes, like yes, yes. I think... I believe in technique. I've been paying a special attention to technique since about 2002. I read a statement by a famous German art critic 
the technique was not important anymore, that the artist should de-skill. And as soon as I read that, I decided to skill up. <laughs> because frankly, I like to disobey rules if I can locate them. It's not always easy <laughs> to find rules in modern art. They're disguised as things you wouldn't want to do. Like you know, the, the way to find the rules in modern art is if you read in the magazine, this is too stupid to want to do. That's a rule. It never says you can't do it. It, it always says you, you wouldn't want to do it. So I always try to do those things if I can. I have a natural tendency to be rebellious due to my upbringing. And that's it. Would you say that is probably why, because I was, so I was reading around, and you've been associated with so many different art movements, and I feel like you don't really belong to any of them. Well, that's true, and that's partly accidental. I'm a friendly person, but <laughs> <laughs> the art moves were so uh, restricted, you know. They wanted you to work like them. That was their idea of a togetherness, like we all use thin paint here or something like that, or we all do abstract shapes, or, or we all have a sense of humor, or something, or we don't have a sense of humor. Whatever it was, it was a group thing, and, and I just don't feel, I don't feel like belonging to any groups. It just, groups annoy me on an art level. I, it's ridiculous, it's descriptive, and I don't understand why people belong to groups. In the modern art field, which if you take a look at it, the obvious purpose is to be different. And so why do people join up in these groups so they can be the same? It beats me, I don't know. Is that what, we can really see this painting unfortunately, but it's you, I think? That's, it yeah, seems yeah. like it's you tearing apart a Campbell tomato soup. <laughs> yes, yes. So is that, what, what does that mean? That means you don't want to belong to pop art or is that more of a tease? Uh, it's and... actually making use of pop, well it's making use of Warhol is what it is, because he's famous for having done this can. So I just thought I'd show a negative attitude. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> No special reason. I only met the man twice. Perfectly <laughs> friendly person. Um, a lot of people, completely out of subject, but a lot of people experience art via their cell phone screens. Do you think it, it plays in your favor or, or does that bother you? Uh, well, it doesn't play in my favor. Why, why and not? It doesn't bother me particularly. Well, it's just like a telephone conversation. It's just something that's over. But it also takes the context out of the... You know, it takes the piece out of its context, which can be, we can sometimes play yeah. your favor and other times not have, be so good. Uh, possibly. This is something I haven't thought about, quite frankly. I don't do an enormous amount of thinking. <laughs> um, so Donald Duck, Superman are recurring characters. Why, why Superman? We talked about Donald Duck earlier. Is Superman the same way? Well, I sat there. I was As soon as I realized what my art style was going to be, that it was going to be uh, things from U.S. culture, and uh, I was sitting there at a cafe in Paris enjoying the idea of being there, not speaking French, just relaxing, smoking cigarettes, you know, the goal was, and it's just relaxing, trying to think of what I should put in my art style. Uh, I, um, those were the first things I thought of. I was looking back uh, three or four years until I, to where I lived in the States and trying to remember what was going on there. And, and one of the first things I could remember was Donald Duck and Superman. <laughs> and all the dogs, there's always a little dogs running around. Oh, the little dogs, yeah. Well, that came later, actually. Uh, there is a comic books, well, Superman comics expanded to include Super Horse, Super Girl, Super Woman, uh, Super Baby, Super Everybody, the Super Dog, too, a Super Cat. There is another dog. That's an earlier yeah. work from 63. Um, you said, I try to vote as left as I can. I hope that my paintings will coincide and be far left, but frequently they're not. That's true. Frequently the painting rebels and goes fascist on me. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I said that during the Vietnam War, actually. I was trying hard 
to explain why my Vietnam paintings didn't protest the war hardly at all. Mainly they were just enjoying the war. And that's the reason. I think I have the Vietnam painting. Is it this one or is it another uh, one? It doesn't matter. It could be any of them. Yeah, that's one of them. <laughs> just yeah. a couple. Here's yeah. another one. But the thing is, I, I just, I don't, I, I don't come down on my painting very hard about me. Once the painting has started, and I've done it, and I've got the idea, and I've got the image of print pretty much going, the job of the painting is to be interesting. Interesting to look at. I don't mean like and dislike. I couldn't care less what some critic or collector likes or dislikes. What I'm interested in is a normal person. Can a person look at this picture with some interest for as long as five seconds? Right. Normally, no one looks at any object except for special motivation. Like you know the artist, you know the dealer, you know somebody. I'm not dealing on that level. I'm trying to get to the level where there's some actual reason for looking. I heard you use the term glamorous before. Yeah, I tried to. Painting. Try. I, I try to make the painting glamorous. Meaning like glowy because you say they glow. Glowy, or just yes, like yeah, it should attractive. glow, it should glow. If, if, if it can't glow, it should be dramatic as possible. Right. And is that, the, all your characters are disordered. Is that a way to dehumanize them or, or is that oh. part of the glamour? Ah, it's to make them look more interesting. To make them look more You've interesting. You've seen a lot of people who are not distorted. If you look around, nobody's distorted. <laughs> I hope so. So, I mean, I tend to make people... A little disordered? A little, yeah. In that way, your sculptures feel like a, like an extension of your paintings. Can you can you talk a bit more about your sculptures? You haven't done well, as I, many I, paintings. I made very few. I made them all about 1965 through 1968. I only made five or six or seven sculptures all together. Uh, I find it too cumbersome. Too what? Cumbersome and expensive. It's too hard to move around. Mm -hmm. I don't like having employees. Nobody works for me. When you phone me up, I answer the phone. There is no studio manager. I don't want anybody hanging around that I'm not personally connected to. My wife and I share a large studio building, and uh, that's it. And you guys work together sometimes? <laughs> Not really. really. Well, we, we talk about it, but we haven't. You haven't? <laughs> we would like to. Maybe we'll get around to it next year. Um, so, beside your loneliness, you, 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 you've taught at the University of Texas? Yes, very, very good experience. Why? Uh, it, it helped me to be comfortable with people. Uh, when you're facing a class, like I had, like, in each class with 17 people, and um, only about three to five of these people were planning to be artists. The rest were ordinary people, but for some reason their degree plan called for them to take an art class and they heard that mine was easy, which it was. I gave an automatic A and you didn't have to show up. <laughs> so <laughs> that That's was nice. it, you know. <laughs> I didn't get fired either. I was there 19 years treating them like this, and everything worked out fine. And have you learned anything about your own work while teaching others? Oh, I learned a gift of gab. How to behave in a situation like this. Because <laughs> these people are bored stiff. You know, these people are bored stiff. You have to say something entertaining mm. within, the next, within the next half hour, or they're gone. Right, that's interesting. And they might be interesting people. I actually met some very interesting people who were not planning to be artists. But then became, a couple of them became pretty well-known artists. Yes, occasionally they show up in the art world, absolutely. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Are you proud? It, I don't feel a single thing on the <laughs> <laughs> I feel nothing about this. I, I must be lacking feelings on a certain level. <laughs> So you also, does that make you not feel anything that people like Jim Shaw, Cause, Aaron Curry, Jonas Wood, Carol Dunham have recognized well, that's good, that's good. If that's fine, if that's true, that's fine. I mean, not only is it fine, I'm grateful. 
but I don't really know anything about it, and I think it's unwholesome to speculate on it. Right. How, in, in general, how do you feel about the new generation of artists? Is there anything that you've seen that you that you liked, or yeah, a whole I mean, movement that's happening that you can see on the corner of your eye? I, I, I know lots of good artists, sure. Okay. I mean, I don't know any of them very Michael. well. I don't know any of them very well. I keep not using this right, excuse me. I don't know any of them very well. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, Dana Schutz, Michael Williams, these are people I've met, you know, right. and seem friendly. Nicole Eisenman, I met her about 2002, 2003. Uh, let's see, you know, we have to, uh, Sally and I have to learn to expand our social life. On the other hand, we're very, very busy. So we don't want to expand our social life. I can see that. Um, so you mentioned Dana Schutz. I, I wanted to talk to you about the debate around her oh, piece yeah. at the Whitney Biennale. It was very interesting to me. And as an artist who paints about many subjects that don't necessarily relate to you directly, or affect you yeah, personally, yeah. How, what's your take on the whole? Oh, my take is, first of all, I was very envious of getting such a tremendous Attention. response. <laughs> I wished I painted the picture. However, I actually, uh, my, uh, my feelings, what I would have done is jumped in a cab and gone right down to the museum and confronted this guy who evidently feels that because he has the same skin color as the crime victim, that he has some sort of right to determine what the artist is going to paint. This I absolutely disagree with, totally, 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 totally. I, I, I feel free to paint any damn thing, skin color of any type, and I don't feel any bonded, I, I don't feel any bond with people who have white skin, and I don't have any problem with people with other skins, and I just, there have been many crime victims for many, many reasons. And I feel free to do any of them if I so wish. So this piece, for instance, represents police violence. Uh, you've also mentioned yes, women's yes. rights. You definitely talk about those kind of subjects. Um, yeah, that's true. Not that's true. much has changed in Paris. That's from 1980. This is imaginary, but it's based on when I, we lived in New York originally in the late 70s, and there was a lot of crime going on in the subways. Not that I ever experienced any crime whatsoever, but it was an interesting subject. And I painted a series of paintings, well, a very small series, two large and maybe four small, of the subway, people getting massacred. This, to me, was entertaining. However, that's the wrong attitude. I realize this is the wrong attitude. I mean, I approached this in, from an immature, uh, viewpoint. I mean, I don't want to have a responsible attitude. Everybody's got a responsible attitude. So what, you know? Would you make a different work nowadays if you were to depict the same kind of subject? Or well, I, I thought of doing this I, because I had some inspiration for a, a new subway massacre, but this time it's it, of Islamic terrorists come onto a subway car with their guns blazing and the cops meet them, disguised as ordinary people somewhat, and blow the hell out of them. This excites me as a painting. However, I've asked about three or four people in the art world whether I should paint this, and they all say, please, Peter, don't paint that picture. <laughs> Just gonna cause trouble. And in fact, the big subway picture did cause trouble, because after I painted it, this is 1979, 1980, uh, it was a featured in my next art show here in New York. And I thought, gee, maybe I'll help the art show to get looked at if I send one of these beautiful color postcards that the galleries made of my subway massacre to the police commissioner. <laughs> because the reason what gave me this idea was I finished it up in an art school in San Francisco, and the art school was patrolled by a couple of cops who were part-time art students. And they thought, gee, this is a wonderful painting, Peter Saul. This is fabulous. At last, what cops do is really being dealt with. So I felt very proud. So when I got back to New York, I sent uh, one of these 
colored postcards of the painting to the police commissioner. And about two weeks later, I went into the gallery to see how my show was. Deserted, of course, nobody there. But the thing was, Mr. Frumpkin, the art dealer, said, Peter Saul, did you send a colored postcard to the police commissioner? And I said, yeah, I did, very proudly. And he said, well, look at the answer I got. And, and here's a letter from the police commissioner to the art dealer. It says, you filthy bastard. We're going to go up there and break your knees and all that kind of stuff. You know, all misspelled and violent and full of hate. Just like unbelievable nonsense. And I felt so embarrassed. I said, God, I'm sorry. I pictured the cops coming upstairs and destroying this nice man who befriended me for 20 years. And I thought, what am I going to do? And he said, don't worry about it. He said, they're not going to do anything, but don't send any more letters to the police. Don't send any more photographs. So I said, okay, I promise, never again. And that was it. But it did create a reaction, so it must have made you somehow happy. No, it made me feel terrible because I wanted the show to be a success. I wanted people to look at the picture with interest. I didn't realize the police commissioner was going to become violent. I can see that. The, the subway painting you just um, described kind of reminds me of the Stalin. You can't really see it, but it's Stalin shooting at a bunch of Nazis. Is that similar? That was made in 2007. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stalin one of my favorites. <laughs> I, I, I do better with the bad guys than the good guys. Uh, we have a lot of bad guys, and they have some bad guys. And, uh, one I haven't finished with is Hitler himself, but then again, that's a problem, because so many people feel very, very bad about that, that I've been begged not to paint it. But anyway... Uh, so still Stalin, was, Stalin was very good when I shrunk him down to a three-foot high character. He became very interesting artistically. When he was full size, he was boring. <laughs> Too expected. <laughs> Visual. Because in most of these cases, I was the first to paint the picture of these people. Like Stalin has hardly been dealt with by nobody but me, probably, in American modern art. And Hitler who I've only done once, actually. Uh, I was sure I'm the first living American artist to want to show Hitler blowing his brains out, you know. I haven't got satisfaction out of it yet. <laughs> when I picture his brain on little legs, jumps out of his head at the last minute. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, uh, no, that can't nothing. sell that well, though, having oh. Nazi art. Yeah, that's true. I mean. One thing I never think about is sales. I just don't think about it. I try to adapt, adopt a snooty attitude, which is based on I don't know what, but I have this feeling there's an artist personality that looks down upon the question of money, period. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> there is no such thing as talking about money or sales or anything like that. You just talk about you, you make a choice. You either talk about your false feelings or you just say any damn thing like I'm doing. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, anybody has any questions in the audience? Not, not at all. No. I, what I do is I make a drawing of it, a small image, which has to have promise. If it's not promising, I don't go any further than that. How many paintings do you destroy? Would you well, very rarely do I destroy a painting. Occasionally, well, more than occasionally, about one out of five paintings, I dislike intensely because the idea wasn't worth doing in the first place. Right. It lacked any real good purpose. Awesome. Anybody else? You seem to have a pretty strong political opinion. So, do you have a problem when your political opinion is opposite to what? To your clients? No, 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 no. I never concern myself with my... With, well, first of all, I rarely, if ever, meet any client. <laughs> that would be a situation that would be very, very extraordinary. And... 
oddly enough, they find me more tiresome and anxiety producing than I find them. <laughs> so I noticed that after half an hour with an art collector, he's sweaty and trembling and wants to get the hell out, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think for some reason, I personally am more troubling than my paintings. <laughs> That's the answer I wanted to hear. That's the answer you wanted to hear. Okay, we have more questions? No? All right. Do you want to add anything else? Not unless you ask a question. It hasn't been a full hour. It hasn't been a full hour, but I ran out of, we answered 36 questions. You have really fast answers. Oh, I, I asked her too quickly. I'm very, very sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's great. It makes it more interesting. Well, okay. Well, ask me a couple more. Okay. Oh, we have one question over there. Just now? Let me just break the bag. What do I do? Why you choose Stalin? Stalin? Yes. Like, well, why you just... didn't choose Stalin to send a lot of people to Siberia like Ah, uh, okay. No reason. There's no reason. Um, no, he's simply a celebrity. Stalin, in my opinion, is a celebrity. Okay. He's in the same category as Ronald Reagan yeah. and... Uh, Marilyn Monroe, if I ever did her. Okay, Walt Disney, Walt Disney character. So he kind of uh, loved the celebrity. I'm not truthful to history. I've read history. I've, I've read Gibbons' Decline and Fall. Yeah. And I, I, I like history. And I read every single thing I can about the Holocaust. I love to know this kind of thing. But um, it doesn't influence my art. My art is so determined to do its job as modern art. You see, the big deal is, this is modern art. It doesn't have anything to do with what I like or you like or just like. It's got a job to do. It's got to be modern art. It's got to stand beside important abstract paintings that cost millions of dollars. My picture has to be there. Somebody has to say, why, that's quite interesting. I wonder who made that thing. Peter Soulmate. Uh, this might not have anything to do with art, but if, I, if you were to go and buy a sandwich right now, what kind of sandwich would you get? Uh, What's your favorite type of sandwich? Well, I avoid, Serious all, question. I avoid all sandwiches with mustard that I don't like. Now, if it has yeah, meat, mayonnaise kind of meat, Cheese, skip the mustard. Thank you. Yeah. Did I do it for you? Did you do what? Is that enough? Yeah. Oh, sorry, we have more questions in the day. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, what was the inspiration behind the uh, donut paintings, like the glazed donut paintings? Which donut paintings were these? There was, uh, I was, well, I mean, I was kind of thinking, it was like, there was, uh, there was like some words in the beginning of like food and like, kind of like... Oh, yeah. I had photographs. I had photographs, and it's a pleasure to paint. So I try to get food into my picture when I can. I bought a few of these magazines that cost $10, you know, sort of super chef magazines, mm -hmm. and I tear out pages, and I get inspired from that. And I, the first one I did was very successful, in my opinion. It has a piece of cake and a piece of pie making love. <laughs> this was back there in the uh, 90s, back in the early 90s. And I, I really enjoy this kind of painting. I like food to come alive. I'm right now doing a painting with some food in it. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. I feel like these paintings are very American, and they're very, like, an idea of a perfect cake. Why do you think Europeans are, are so interested in your work? Because it represents so much about American culture and American uh, politics. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, well, I think it's true. I've been considered 
a critic of American culture, but all I was doing was making use of American culture. And I never said no to the idea that I was criticizing it. I never said no to the idea I was criticizing it because uh, I want the picture to get looked at and get its share of art appreciation. So if the person thinks I'm criticizing U.S. culture, okay. I'm not going to fight it, you know. I'm not a person who insists on the truth. Yeah. Fake news is okay with me. I read a review. Well, this is something important. I read a review recently in the New York Times of a book about people who've seen flying saucers. Did you know that 121,000 people have reported seeing a flying saucer? <laughs> now, can you be sure that none of these people actually saw a flying saucer? Is it of absolute certainty? If you phoned up the New York Times tomorrow morning and said, I've seen a flying saucer, what would they do? I mean, fake news is fake news, maybe. But I mean, since the advent of Trump, I've come to sort of accept fake news as being any kind of news. True. Any other questions? No? All right. Any last advice for any young artists in this room? Well, uh, let me think fast. Try and avoid advice. Advice, avoid taking advice is my first thing that I have to say. Because the, the reason for that is because advice itself is always meant to help you to join some sort of happy throng. Like if you follow this advice, you'll have an art show. You'll be together with ten other people who make money or something like that. Advice is always aimed at helping the person who's getting the advice, that's not what you need. You need to be different because the problem with art is the same modern art, is the same problem as modern cars, ice boxes, everything else, gymnasiums, grocery stores. There's too many. The worker has worked too hard. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's more art shows than anyone can ever see. Even if you have a helicopter and a limousine, and nothing else to do in your life. You couldn't see all the art shows that are going on. It's impossible. Even the art forest can't do more than a hundred part of them. So I would say avoid advice. Avoid advice and try and be self-confident and do what you want. For unknown reasons, people, when the modern art thing comes up, look for guidance. I don't understand it, but people look for guidance. Don't look for any guidance. Just do what you want to do. If you think Van Gogh is the best artist, okay. Not, no one's going to really argue with you. If you like somebody else instead, that's okay too. I like that.